owners have a variety of tools at their disposal to manage pests in the landscape. An integrated pest management system combines many of these different strategies to create a comprehensive management plan. We recently looked at one of these tools, the use of alternative chemicals, including microbial pesticides. Today I want to look at another management tool, biological control. Biological control is essentially the work of natural predation and natural mortality factors in the landscape. In essence, we're allowing nature to work at its fullest potential. Oftentimes, natural predation is disrupted in the manicured landscape through the use of chemical pesticides by planting monocultures or all one crop together and through frequent disruptions to the environment, particularly through mowing. Now with biological control, we have three different techniques that we can use to reestablish natural predation. And the first of these is conservation biological control. Conservation biological control works to reestablish and enhance natural predator-prey relationships. Um, when we think of natural enemies in the landscape, we think of the three Ps, pathogens, predators, and parasitoids. And all of these cause natural mortality. Parasitoids are probably the least uh, familiar to us, and these are tiny insects that develop their young inside of other insects. They're very similar to parasites, but parasites do not ultimately kill their host, whereas parasitoids do. So in conservation biological control, we want to reestablish these natural mortality factors mainly by providing the uh, necessary environment, so resources such as shelter and food. And we do a lot of this by planting nectar-rich flowers in the landscape to attract natural enemies. Another form of biological control is importation or classical biological control. And this is a strategy that gardeners don't practice. It's a highly regulated science that involves the introduction of a natural enemy from another location to control an invasive pest. A common example in Oklahoma would be the use of herbivorous beetles to control musk thistle. The final method of biological control is augmentation, and this involves the purchase and release of natural enemies into the landscape. Homeowners can practice this method, and it's practiced in two ways. One, the first way is to overwhelm an existing pest problem. So perhaps you have a huge outbreak of aphids in your garden. You could purchase a natural enemy, such as lady beetles, and release those to bring that pest outbreak under control. In this way, it's a lot like using a chemical pesticide to manage a, an existing problem. More commonly, however, augmentation biological control is used to avoid a pest problem. And with this strategy, we release natural enemies early in the season before a pest becomes a problem. And that natural enemy can work to keep those pest populations under control. And the natural enemies will reproduce in the landscape to provide season-long pest management. The process of augmentation biological control involves the purchase and release of natural enemies. And of course you want to purchase from a reputable source and you want to do a little bit of research before you go purchasing a natural enemy. Not all of them are created equally. They have different prey choices. So the first step is to identify your pest properly. Once you know that, you can select an appropriate biological control agent. Now the most commonly used uh, biological control agents for augmentation in the home garden are the lady beetle and the green lacewing. Lady beetles feed on a variety of pests, um, but particularly aphids, and other soft-bodied insects like scales and white flies. They'll also feed on the eggs of small insects as well, uh, such as beetles and uh, lepidopteran. Uh, or caterpillars. Now the most commonly available commercially is the Hippodamia convergens or the convergent lady beetle. Now the green lacewing is another commonly purchased natural enemy and 
what I have here are the green lacewing eggs and they're mixed in with rice hulls and the reason for that is these are incredibly voracious predators and once the insects, the larvae emerge from the eggs, they'll just start feeding on each other. So these rice holes give them a place to hide in there so they don't start feeding on one another. Um, it also helps you disperse them more evenly in the garden when you kind of shake them out over your plants. Now these will also feed on aphids. In fact, a common name for them is the aphid lion. There's a number of parasitoids or really tiny wasps that are available for purchase and release. And the most common for the home gardener is the trichogramma. Now, these cards here have 30,000 trichogramma on there. They are very tiny little insects. And usually we don't see them readily in the landscape. There are naturally occurring parasitoids. We usually see the evidence of them in the form of little mummies left behind. Now the way we release these, they come on simple cards with a hook and we just hook them right onto our plant and in a day or two the uh, wasps will emerge and they will parasitize new hosts. Another parasitoid wasp that is commonly used is Incarcia formosa and um, a few of these have emerged so you can see how very tiny they are. They're about the size of the head of a pin and this species is used most commonly for greenhouse white flies, but a homeowner might use it if they bring their outdoor plants in for the winter into a sunroom. That's a location where you might use this insect. And they're so tiny you really wouldn't notice them flying around in their sunroom. Now another very common predator is the predatory mite. We're all familiar with pest mites like the two-spotted spider mite. Um, but there's also predatory mites, and again, they come in a carrier, and what you're going to see if you sprinkle them out on a piece of paper, you're going to see some little tiny movements in there, and that's the mite, and it's, they're so tiny, they're even smaller than our wasps, um, so they can be a little bit of a challenge to see, but they're going to do a wonderful job of feeding on our pest mites in the landscape, real handy on our evergreen plants that get a lot of mites. Oh, when the, in the heat of the summer, a little bit later in the season. I have another parasitoid, and in farm settings, if you keep animals, a lot of times flies are a big problem. And there are actually parasitoids of flies that you can release. And they come as a pupa, and you would put these out in your stable or wherever you keep your animals, and the Parasitoids will emerge from that and then they will attack um, the flies in the landscape and help keep them under control. So another form of parasitism that we can put to work. And finally, I have a predatory snail. And this is a decollete snail and it will feed on garden snails that feed on our plants. Um, so I could see this being very handy in our hosta garden, for example. Now it's important to know that just because a natural enemy is available for purchase, we don't it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing to purchase. There's plenty of insects for sale that aren't necessarily uh, ideal to release. The best example of that is the praying mantid. Praying mantids are generalists, and if you purchase and release a whole bunch of praying mantids in the landscape, um, what's going to happen is they're going to feed upon each other as well as just about anything else they could get their claws on and you're going to end up with one really large fat praying mantid. So do your research and make sure that you're purchasing something that's going to be effective. If you're interested in purchasing natural enemies to release in the garden, there's a few considerations that will help you meet with success. The first thing is to properly identify your pest insect so that you can purchase an appropriate control agent. Do some research so that you understand the best control option for your pest situation. You also want to understand the best time to release the natural enemy based on both the pest's life cycle as well as the life cycle of that natural enemy. Also, research the proper release methods so that when your insects arrive, you're ready to put them out into the landscape. 
You also want to make sure that you have a good delivery site. Have your insects delivered to a location where they could be immediately taken care of. As you can imagine, these insects could cook pretty quickly if they're sitting in a box on the porch in the Oklahoma sun. Finally, you want to purchase your natural enemies from a reputable source. Rincon Vitova, Gardens Alive, IPM Labs, these are a few of the many companies that sell natural enemies. You can also learn more about biological control by visiting the Midwest Institute for Biological Control website.